<laughs> What's up? Frozen hand. Frozen How hand. are you? Good. How you doing, man? Man, I'm just happy to be here. Another uh, another great day in Penalty Box Live world, and uh, I'm going to turn my volume down here just to uh, just to shade. Uh, but no, just happy to be here. Excited for our guest today. This is good yeah. stuff. Yeah, weather's, weather's kind of getting uh, nice, and uh, the sun's coming up a little earlier. And the Woodstock Inn and Brewery over there, love those folks. They're awesome. Yeah, you got you got to get it right. You got to go opposite there. Uh, so no, things are good. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, you know, I'm thrilled to have our guest on today. Uh, Pat's a great guy and, uh, has lived a, uh, incredible, incredible life. And, uh, yeah, no, here in, uh, here in, uh, New Hampshire, it's uh, getting warmer. I'm going to, uh, going to test drive a new motorcycle on Friday. So I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, so. sweet. What kind of, what kind of bike are you going to get? I'm looking at the. Uh, I'm not a Harley guy. I, I know that I don't put off that Har Harley vibe. I'm sure. Uh, I think but, you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm looking at like a 2020 um, Goldwing, uh, Honda Goldwing. Yeah, very nice. cool. Nothing uh, says old like a Goldwing. So that's me. Welcome to the. Yeah. Welcome to the <laughs> well, I've got a couple of shots on goal, so let's kick this off with some shots on goal today. I'm gonna let you go first, sir. Well, great. Well, mine's uh, mine's pretty quick. Um, uh, Wes, if you could uh, put up the image. Uh, I know we were talking in the pregame a little bit about baseball. And, uh, I, yeah. you know, I used to be a huge fan. And uh, baseball has really uh, done, you know, themselves a, a disjustice over the years in a number of ways. But, you know, I saw this on the news today, and I was excited because, you know, it's not very often that Boston uh, does, uh, especially the Sox, does anything that out of the norm. And right. uh, here is uh, – here is a, a sample of what uh, the Sox uniforms are going to look like at seven home games this year. For the first time since 1993, they've uh, changed up the, um, the the red B on the Navy cap, and yep. uh, they're going with a little bit of a Boston Strong, Boston Marathon, uh, uh, you know, Patriots Day theme. So, you know, hats yep. off to the Sox for that. And, you know, they started off 0-3, uh, oh and, and now they've won the last two games, and so they're going to end yep. up ruining our summer. Just thought it would be <laughs> yeah, I feel you on that. I, I saw that yesterday. I saw the the uniform and I, I you know, like I said, you know, Oklahoma football is that way. Like nothing ever changes on their uniform. And so something like that is just seems crazy, absurd and nuts. But but I, I like it. Um, I want to throw out a little shot on goal here. I guess maybe a little love to our uh, guest, uh, Bill Haston, who was on a few weeks ago. His final four was Gonzaga, Baylor, Houston and Florida State. He got three of the four correct. He got the final two right, and he picked the winner. So wow. shout shout out to Bill Haston, a little shot on goal for that. Um, but Gonzaga, you know, they roll into this undefeated. I think they would have been if they'd won the first team in like 45 years or something like that, or since 1945 or something to go undefeated and win the title. And and they just got ran out of the gym Monday night. Well, I mean, I think I think that last close. second. I think that last second shot, uh, you know, was there. That was it, you know, to yeah. get them in the finals. I think their luck ran out. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. So, so I got one more. Go ahead. What else you got? I'm done. That's it. That's what I got. Oh. Well, I've got one more in the world of like really bizarre, weird stuff that intrigues me a little bit. And Wes, if you could throw this video up, um, Miss Sri Lanka was crowned uh, this past week. And and if the video will play, they 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 uh, this is the lady right here that they're that they're putting the crown. Is that the beginning? No, the lady they just took the crown off of her head. She won, and then she was automatically disqualified because she had been divorced. What? We take the this other lady who who comes on here wearing this gold push up bra thing comes over and takes the microphone and says. She has been divorced, so she has been disqualified. And they take the crown off of this poor girl, and they give it to this uh, to the second runner-up or first runner-up. And I'm like, how does how does that happen? Do they not know in advance that that she? I mean, like it's just so bizarre, but bizarre, funny. And then they're all like hugging and kissing on her, and she's like, oh my god, I won. Like I I don't even know how I'd feel about that. Well, you know, it was it Vanessa Williams that was Miss America that back in the late 80s that, uh, you know, was Miss America for a second before some stuff came out. But she at least got to keep the keep the crown on for a little while. Yeah, keep the tiara, right? I mean, and, and, right. and 
in in fairness, she was in Playboy or something. So that's cool. Like this, right. like right, right, right. she apparently been divorced once. So that to me is just bizarre. So if anybody wants to really look that up, you know, feel free to 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 take a look. At, but it was just one of those weird things that I'm like, is this even real? Like, yeah, right. but anyway, poor poor Miss Sri Lanka. I just <laughs> nice for her. So. Um, Wes, Wes has a video he wanted to throw up here and I, I, you know, I think he's got it queued up. Wes, what do you got? Wes has got maybe a little Wesley shot on goal. Wes, where's it at? Oh, so this is Jack Black and Jimmy Fallon, uh, redoing a little extreme on, uh, you know, at, uh, not an SNL on, uh, the Jimmy Fallon show, which kind right. of into our guest a little bit today. So. But and we'll then, have to get his uh, opinion on weird, that. But this was actually really good. Well, I'm sure that they didn't record it live. <laughs> no, and, and 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 Pat wasn't there with his feet kicked up, you know, doing this with a lighter either. So no, I think that's actually him down front. I have a feeling. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. Well, I don't have any more shots on goal. So so if you want to introduce our guest, let's let's roll with this thing. I'm great. Gonna- Let me introduce. I'll tell you. Uh, we're great honored to have uh, Pat here today. Pat is a uh, one of the founding members of Extreme, an American American rock band formed in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in 1985. He joined in 1986. Um, God, they had some great ex- success in the 80s and the 90s with him, uh, Gary Sharon, uh, uh, Nino Betancourt, and uh, Paul Geary. Uh, they released five studio albums, two LPs in Japan two compilation albums since their formation. Uh, again, one of the top selling uh, rock bands in ni- in the 1990s. And uh, we're thrilled to have him here today. Hey, Pat. Dang. And he's in a cave. That's- I'm in the, yeah, I call this place uh, my the Pat Cave. Nice. Oh. Yeah, I it's like my, it. uh, my humble little recording studio. It actually looks a little darker than when we were uh, on earlier, but. Yeah, oh, I, think, well. I think you did that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll Maybe be more mysterious. Yeah. You're gonna have to get one of the lighters. You know? I gotta call Alfred. See uh, when he's gonna pull up. The phone. <laughs> get, get your car. Get your car warmed up. Um, <laughs> I want. I want to kick this off with a question, like. In the 80s and 90s, you're in the rock bands, and I think maybe Extreme, because of More Than Words, kind of maybe got a little bit of a weird rap of being ballad type guys when you guys were kind of more rockery anyway. But, like, how – how was there, like, an arms race to see who could have the biggest hair? Um. Well, you know, they did call the era of bands hair bands for a reason, you know. Right. But, uh, you no, know, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. You know, all those bands from that, from the era where, um, you know, late eighties, early nineties, um, it was just a, a fun time where the guys had bigger teased, more teased up hair than the girls did. You know, <laughs> <laughs> my sister in the eighties used, um, Aquanet. I mean, did, did, were you an Aquanet guy? How did you, how did you do? Uh, no, no, it was just, uh, purely based on, uh, you know, the, the teasing methods. There was not a lot of hair <laughs> going on. Gotcha. Okay. But, uh, All right. I was just curious. So, so Pat, let me, let me ask you, you know, you graduate high school in 1985. In 1986, yep. you're, you're in extreme. In 1987, you guys get, you land a record deal. And in 1989, you're touring the world. How surreal was that? Um, you know, it really, uh. You know, you just hit the nail on the head. It was surreal. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, you grow up listening to all, like, you know, the classic rock bands. We grew up on Aerosmith, Van Halen, ACDC, uh, you know. So I went to the Boston Garden, and I saw all those bands, and I always dreamed of, you know, someday playing there, playing, you know, big stages. And, um, you know, we, uh, it was like the prepared met the opportunity. We, you um, None of us really went to, to college uh, for, you know, none of us graduated college, I should say. And um, we basically just threw ourselves at rehearsing every day, writing songs, recording. And, um, you know, there was no if, and, or but. We were like, we're going to do this until we make it, you know. And, uh, you know, we saw a lot of momentum happening in the Boston club scene. And, you um, uh, we're lucky enough to hook up with some people that had our demo tapes heard by the right people. And uh, they'd start coming seeing us at the clubs and saw the packed house. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of fans there um, that we had made locally. And, you know, like you said, before 
it, it wasn't really that long after I had joined. I was the last guy to join the band. You know, the, the guys had had some momentum before I joined. But, um, uh, you know, we it wasn't long after I joined that, you know, like we did have some showcases. And before you knew it, we were off to the races, you know. When did when did you first pick up a guitar? Um, I'd say about eight o'clock this morning. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I played guitar when I was young, like uh, middle school. You know, my my older brother played guitar, and he was um, he played acoustic, and uh, you know, he was more into folk, you know, folk stuff, and and. Uh, you know, Beatles and a lot of the the uh, English invasion, the British invasion stuff. Um, yeah. So I was exposed to music at a very young age. And, um, you know, I guess uh, I, I started guitar lessons when I was like, you know, in middle school or something and then switched to bass, um, you know, right right before I joined, uh, right, you know, around high school. Were your, were your parents musicians? Neither of my parents were, no. Interesting. It seems like a lot of musicians that are very, very good. They have some influence, you know, from a parent. But was your brother a pretty good influence on? Oh you? yeah, my brother was a big influence. Um, my aunt, actually, my my dad's sister, she was the one that gave us our first guitar. So, um, you know, I think uh, again, just being exposed to a lot of great music when I was young, you know, Beatles and stones the who all that stuff had a lasting impression you know and then i used to rush home from uh from uh elementary school just to, to catch the monkeys on tv so i was like <laughs> with, uh, you know you, uh, the, you, you took know. one of my questions you took one of my questions i was gonna say could you explain how the monkeys were a big influence on you i swear yeah. to god I read, written so, right there I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, that was kind of uh, their little videos within the show was kind of the birth of, you know, music videos. Um, right. I actually recently watched a uh, one of those, you know, kind of uh, documentary uh, or, you know, the, one of the shows based on the monkeys. And it was uh, it, it was pretty fascinating to, to watch. Uh, you know, I hadn't really realized it until I watched the show. What a. Um, you know, a, a lot of things they were groundbreaking. You know, they were one of those put together by Hollywood bands. It wasn't like an organic thing, you know. So all those bands like, you know, New Kids Walk in Sync and all those those kind of things were all modeled after the monkeys business model, you know. Other people cool. wrote the songs for them. They just recorded them, you know. But it was uh it was it was fun to watch when I was a kid, you know. Sure. That's so, funny. So you're you're born in Dorchester, uh, uh, grew up in Situate, and then moved to Winchester. Uh, but in like tenth grade, your father pulled you out and moved your family to Texas, right? Uh, uh, so if I, right. So yeah. can you tell me what you took away from your your time in uh, Zane Gray? Oh, Zane Gray. So that yeah. was. Uh, <laughs> you must have gone on Wikipedia or something, because a lot of that I did stuff some, really I did some I did some research. Um, yeah. So you know, Zane Gray was uh, my high school band in Texas. I, you know, like you said, I, I halfway through my sophomore year in in high school, um, I went to you know I was going to Winchester High School in Massachusetts, and uh, that was probably like a thousand kids in the entire school, and so I moved to Texas, and suddenly I'm in a school where there's four thousand kids. And, wow. um, but I didn't know a soul, like, you know, you walk in, I, I would literally went to school on a Friday and then, uh, you know, in Winchester moved to Texas. And on Monday morning I was in high school and I remember I was like terrified cause I didn't know anybody. I was like sitting in the lunchroom by myself, you know, and, uh, it, it, you know, I, I played bass at the time. Um, I had played in, you know, in Massachusetts. And then when I, I met some guys in school in Texas and we started playing in a band and suddenly I had, you know, a bunch of friends. So it was, it's amazing how music kind of uh, introduced me to a lot of, a lot of really good people in Texas. And, um, you know, it was a, just a cover band. We'd get together in our garage or I had a room above my garage and we'd uh, play everything from Ozzy to, you know, Quiet Riot, Van Halen, Scorpions, Rush, all that stuff, you know. Uh, so it was just it was it was a fun time, you know, being a, a little uh, little cover band down there. That's awesome. Hey, I'm I'm curious about 
I'm in sales, have a sales team. Tim has the team. I'm curious about the the leadership aspect of a band when that. So when you when Extreme comes together, like is there one guy that like this is the leader, or is it all four people have a voice and and someone's the makes the overall decision? How, I'm guessing every band may be different, but but how was that for you in your in your career? Yeah, every band is different, and um, you know. And, Extreme in particular, it was really our original drummer that had a lot to do with the business aspect and relationships. And, and uh, you know, he'd be the guy that was the point person to all the clubs. Like before we had a manager, he would basically manage the band. And then uh, once we really started, um, you know, taking off, we had uh, a proper, you know, manager where it wasn't a, a band member. Um, musically, uh, Nuno has always been the... Uh, you know, the main guy, the writer of the music and, and kind of the uh, the musical director of, of that particular band. Um, you know, but again, I've been in a lot of different situations now where, uh, like in the Dark Desert Eagles, I'm kind of that guy where, you know, even though we're playing Eagles music, um, you know, I deal with a lot of the business side of the stuff and, uh, you know, uh, booking the band and that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, every, every band's a little bit different. And, uh, you know, there's always some politics going on and there's always some arm wrestling, just like any business, you know. Right. Uh, you learn each other's strengths, each other's weaknesses, and uh, hopefully try to uh, capitalize on, you know, uh, l like anything. You know, you, you try to get the guy that does, you know, the, the best at, at certain aspects of the business, You uh, they handle that kind of uh, that part of it. Any any fisticuffs on decisions or anything like that that had to be made? Oh, there's always arguments and you know some uh, uh, you know like that's that's what creates tension. But sometimes tension and uh, sometimes you know not agreeing um, can be for the benefit of of you know right. any any project or any business or you know that th things. It's not always just. Uh, uh, you know, rainbows and, and uh, unicorns, you know, it's, it can be, you know, yeah. um, black jelly beans. Yeah. It can be black jelly beans. <laughs> Clive, Clive, Abbott. Abbott. Clive is, uh, is watching us from uh, England. He's a friend of mine who lives in England. Um, that's a great segue. You had uh, mentioned in an interview once that uh, your uh, dark De desert Eagles, you, you used to being Scotty in the uh, engine room. And uh, now you're Captain Kirk sitting in, in the chair. Uh, all of those decisions all fall on your shoulders. Uh, and now you get to, you know, sing lead, which, which is something uh, that I know, know you're very good at and something that you probably wanted to do during Extreme as well. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, well, like you said in, in how I touched on it, you know, I do have a different role in the Dark Desert Eagles than I, than I have ever had in Extreme. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always sang background vocals in Extreme, and I've played bass for 30 years in that band. Uh, but now in Dark Desert Eagles, I'm getting to play rhythm guitar, um, a little bit, you know, of uh, lead guitar, and um, I sing all the vocals. So I'm singing all the Glenn Fry and the Don Henley songs. And uh, it was a tremendous challenge, you know, because those songs, um, as you know, they're, they're uh, the Eagles are second to none as far as all the uh songwriting harmonies melodies the amount of hits that they have and you know when we when we go out and play live if you mess up the words to hotel california everybody knows it you know You're right. <laughs> right. Or, or desperado i take a deep breath and go oh, shit i better not fuck this up because <laughs> right. like, you know, miss one nuance of one line you know everyone knows yeah. so uh, right. but it's it's uh it's a lot of fun you know like Playing in a tribute band or a you know a cover band, um, it kind of brought me back to the egg of like what we were just talking about before. It was like getting together with the guys in the basement and or in the garage and and playing the songs that you grew up listening to or the songs that you love. Uh, so you know it's it's been fun to kind of uh, you know started this whole project maybe four or five years ago and it's just been a blast. You know. Um, Wes, I don't know fact, but Wes is the lead singer in a uh, Britney Spears tribute band called Oops, <laughs> Wes Again. I, any chance maybe we can get you to play some some guitar in that or maybe sing with, with Wes a little bit? That would be a definite <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. 
Hey, I, he wanted me to ask, so I said I'd ask. So, but that's a definite no, Wes. I'll so, go to the show, but I don't know any Britney Spears songs. I really don't, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, 1989, you guys are touring the world, and then you had the opportunity of a lifetime in 1992. Can you talk about playing Wembley Stadium in front of 80,000 people and how unbelievable it was, even backstage? So that, um, you know, really was one of the pinnacles of, of uh, extremes, you know, roller coaster ride of a career. Um, it was one of the high points for sure. You know, we had uh, met Brian May, the guitar player from Queen, um, and it was before Freddie died. Um, and he was real, uh, you know, we had a real connection with him. He saw Extreme as being a very diverse band, not to compare us to Queen, you know, as far as our, you know, uh, success or legendary status that they have. But as far as stylistically, we didn't have, you know, a lot of boundaries and we, we did a lot of things that he really respected. And so when Freddie died, you know, they had had uh, plans to do a tribute concert uh, concert for AIDS awareness, but also, you know, a big send off for Freddie. And, um, it, that was another surreal moment where, uh, you know, they had four bands open the show during the day and it was 80,000 people at, at Wembley stadium where, um, I don't know if you've seen the queen movie recently, the, the biopic, uh, yeah. where it ends with them playing at live aid on that stage. And so that was the experience that we had. We were on that same stage uh, at this Freddie Mercury tribute, and it's uh, it's all over you. You know, if you Google it on YouTube, um, we did a, a, a medley of Queen songs. So uh, um, you know, the crowd was with us from the very first note, and uh, to uh, to have you know, you know, we 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 were one of the four bands that opened the show. So it was Metallica. Extreme, Def Leppard, and Guns N' Roses. And then um, then the remaining members of Queen came on stage for the evening part of it. You know, the, they, they had, uh, you know, Roger Daltrey from The Who, uh, Robert Plant, Elton John, George Michael, Seal, Annie Lennox, David Bowie. I mean, it was the who's who was there at the show. And uh, so a lot of these people were like side stage watching us or just backstage and we met one legend after the next, uh, and it was wow. just—it was hard to even believe that we were part of this thing. And you know, ended up making friends with some some people that we never imagined that we would ever have met. You know, in, in the music, you know, people that were legendary to us. Um, so yeah, that was a that was a pretty amazing experience. And coincidentally, it was in April, so we're we're going on like uh, 29th year anniversary of that show um wow that yeah is crazy. Well, i had a question maybe this kind of is part of that but where's the coolest place you ever played Would that be it? you know it's hard to really put my finger and say there's one coolest place i mean that's probably one of the coolest gigs we ever played obviously but right. uh you know we've been down to south america and played big uh outdoor festivals you know two hundred thousand people We've been to Japan, Australia, all through Europe. I mean, there's not a country that we didn't hit in Europe, you know, Spain, France, uh, all the Scandinavian countries, Italy. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world, you know, playing music. So it's been a pretty miraculous ride for a couple of guys from Malden, Medford, and uh, Hudson and Winchester, Massachusetts. One of your first uh, shows that you opened for was in Portland, Maine, uh, at which is probably that was probably called the Civic Center or Cumberland County Civic Center back then. Who knows what it's called now? But you opened for Aerosmith. Um, something happened during COVID that, uh, if you could tell everyone uh, what uh, what might be happening again in 2021, but kind of was the the dagger of COVID for you and your and your group. Yeah, it's actually painful to even think about. <laughs> but, um, so I, one of the first uh, arena shows that Extreme ever played was opening for Aerosmith at, uh, at that show up. Uh, I guess it was the Cumberland County Civic Center, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and it was at, at a time uh, in the 80s when Aerosmith was making their big comeback, you know, with uh, uh, Angel and, uh, you know, it, it was that uh, permanent... Uh, vacation record 
And yeah, so Jamie, uh, Jamie's got a gun or something like that. Or something. Yeah, it was before that one, but it was uh, oh, loving an elevator, I guess. You know that right. that record. So um, they uh, um, they their manager Tim Collins, who actually brought them back from the dead and put them into rehab and the whole whole deal. Like he was also interested in managing Extreme, so he wanted to kind of give us a, a, a shot or try us out, basically. Um, he put us on opening for Aerosmith and for us, we were like, Holy shit, we're playing an arena to 12,000 people sold out. You know, we felt like we, we had made it, you know, and uh, only to find out he passed on us and we were back playing at club three in Somerville, like the next night. So it was a little <laughs> bit of a, uh, you know, um, but ultimately we, uh, we ended up, uh, um, you know, later in our career, we did, do a whole tour with Aerosmith and played, you know, uh, arenas all throughout Europe with them, which was a thrill for us. Um, and then, uh, we, um, we were invited to play at Fenway park with Aerosmith for their 50th anniversary show last September. So we had announced the show. We were selling tickets. It sold out in a matter of like a week. And so yeah. what a thrill it was going to be to, to, to play Fenway park not just with Aerosmith, but you know we've never played that venue. It would be pretty special to to walk out on stage at Fenway. Yeah. Um, and of course, when COVID shut everything down, of course that show got shut down as well, uh, which was you know it was a, a dagger because uh, all last year it's been a series of kick in the can. Like every six months, it'd be like, okay, we'll play. You know that show will be postponed to such and such date, and then we get to closer to that date. Well, no, it's going to be six months from now, six months from now. And so the same thing happened in that particular show where now um, it's supposed to be this coming September. Uh, we're supposed to make up that show, but I've heard through the grapevine, I've heard rumors. It's not officially postponed, but I don't think stadium shows are even going to happen in 2021. So they'll probably be looking to 2022 for that, for that show. Hopefully it happens. Be there. You'll be there. Hopefully minus, it happens. Uh, I'll be there if it minus, happens. Uh, minus Tom Brady, favorite New England Patriot. Minus Tom Brady. Um, you know, I think Teddy Bruschi um, was yeah. is a class act. And uh, I've had a few people that I know that have run into him and stuff. And, and um, I just, I was always a big Teddy Bruschi fan, you know. Love it. Great answer. Great answer. But um, I also oh, got to give a big shout out to Adam Vinatieri because without him, Tom wouldn't have as many rings on his finger. I, I agree a hundred percent. And without uh, Peyton Manning we, or, or uh, Eli Manning, we might have a couple more. So. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. The wholehearted video looks like it was shot in Faneuil Hall. Part of it. Do you remember that? It looks yeah. like. And I watched it last week, so I remember that song. And I watched the video, and I see it, and I'm like, I think that's shot like in the Faneuil Hall area. And you see videos like that that are shot kind of out in public, and people are like, "What the fuck is going on?" Like, the, you know, did, was that kind of are those weird moments shooting video like that? You know, that was the only video we've ever really shot like that out in a public place. Uh, no, actually, we did one other video um, we shot in Times Square. Uh, but they had that blocked off to where no one was really seen in the right. video or a spectator. But this, this, the whole heart of the video was, I I'm trying to remember what street it was on. Um, it wasn't Faneuil Hall, but it was, you know, the, the directors wanted to capture that Boston vibe of the cobblestone, you know, cobblestone right. streets and the, and the brick uh, buildings and stuff. And they, they found a great location for it. I, I wish I knew what street I, or what corner I could tell you where it was. Um, uh, no worries. It, just, it looked like it had that feel. And yeah, like street performers, and you see them down at Faneuil Hall now all the time. And so it, it people were kind of surrounding, you know, and you guys are kind of probably lip syncing and, and people are like, they have this look like, oh, what's yeah. that? Yeah, you know? it, it really, the, the um, you know, the video starts with just a few people and then it builds and builds and builds and before you know it. And it really was organic like that. Well, we, we did put a, it was the days obviously before Facebook or socials where we could post, hey, we're shooting a video, come down, you know. Right. So we had a, you know, a, a small fan club at the time. We did put the word out that we were shooting a video and um, 
it started with like, you know, 10 or 15 people. And then before you know it, there were just, you know, people from that happen to be walking by, like to check it out. And, uh, they're yeah. out grabbing Duncan and they're like, well, what's going on over here? Yeah. What's happening? So, uh, and then we had, uh, Cam Neely and Lyndon Byers come down and they made yeah. a little cameo in the video as well. And, uh, um, yeah, we, I spent many a hangover with, uh, with those two guys after the, you know, <laughs> Lyndon Byers <laughs> came Cam to party, house and party all the time. That's um, cool. Yeah. So, um, do you guys get you 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 know the, you we talk about the uh, more than words being a, a blessing and a curse? Uh, you get a lot of people that go to concerts. I would imagine expecting to hear that kind of music, and then you guys come out with decadent dance and get the funk out. And by the way, great great bass lines on both of those. Um, but more importantly, do you w what does your uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure uh, groupies think of you guys? <laughs> so. Um, well, that's kind of two questions. So uh, right, right. the more the words thing, yeah. I mean, how can you complain about a number one hit in the in the not just the country, but we that thing that song was number one all over the world. Um, so here, even thirty years later, we traveled to places because that song kind of paved the way. You know, um, it was an unusual track for us because it was just Nuno and Gary as an acoustic duet. Um, but you know, like you showed that little clip of Jack Black and Jimmy Fallon. I mean, here we are, like you know, that that came out uh, a few years ago. So that's like, um, yeah. you know, almost thirty years after that song, you know, was released. So uh, how can you complain about having such a big hit? Um, you know, Wholehearted was kind of uh, a, another kind of acoustic song that that I think that one went to number four. So those were our two <laughs> big hits. Where. Uh, um, you know, most of the other stuff, it was a kind of a different representation of uh, um, the majority of our songs is, is much more hard rock, more like, you know, say Aerosmith meets Van Halen, you know, uh, with a the, with the touch of Zeppelin in there, you know. So, um, you know, we, we've never uh, stuck to or had just boundaries where it has been like um, in in more recent time bands always you know they want to know how to package a band that you all the 10 songs in your record sound the same and uh you know we we never kind of fell into that philosophy maybe to our our uh uh you know we, we may have had more success had we had we stuck to more of a that um but you know it is what it is that's that's uh you know, we, we always grew up listening to bands like, you know, I had talked about like, you know, Led Zeppelin would rock hard with like the immigrant song, but then they do go into California, which is more of an acoustic song, you know. So, uh, you know, we, we grew up to listen to bands like Queen and the Beatles that had a much more diverse palette of uh, styles and music. And, um, you know, that's kind of what the, the, you know, what we, we've always done in our, our careers had, you know, different styles thrown into uh, onto our albums. Uh, oh, then the other part of your question was what the the Bill and Ted people? Yeah, uh, yeah that was that was another like the first uh, thing that we ever released, even before our debut record in '89. Uh, we were on the Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure soundtrack, and in the movie, I remember going to the movies to see uh, our song "Play with Me" was featured in the movie in the climax of the movie. Um, in the ice skating or in the mall scene at the end of the movie. So that was, that was fun at the time, you know? Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I bet. It was. Um, COVID changed the world for a lot of people, obviously, but I'm curious from a, like, and you kind of talked it earlier about, you know, the, the Aerosmith uh, Fenway show, but how do, how do guys like you that, that are doing, local bands how did, how do you survive during covid like how how did you adapt and what did you do different to financially keep keep money coming in well um fortunately for extreme you know we've had uh royalties from our past works that you know a lot of bands don't have that kind of you know uh fortune that that they rely a lot on playing live which obviously for us we definitely you know a big part of our income has been live touring, which has been absolutely decimated and shut down. So, uh, 
I feel for the bands that uh, that that's you know their sole source of income. It's been uh, you know it it uh, t if you had told me January last year that I would only play two or three shows for an entire year, I would have said you're crazy. I mean, you know, am I gonna like someone's gonna break my arms or what? You know. <laughs> um, so it has completely devastated the the touring industry, and not just uh, the musicians, but I have a lot of you know, uh, friends that are road crew, sound engineers, uh, drum techs, where um, everybody's just completely hurting. You know, they're, they're taking jobs at like, you know, Amazon warehouses and stuff just to, to get by, you know. So it's uh, it's had a huge impact on the entertainment business and even the club owners, people that own theaters, the agents, you know, people that work for Live Nation, some of the biggest, you know, they've been furloughed and waiting to go back to work and um it's just been really devastating to our industry hmm. when uh when and if uh extreme ever uh tours again which i'm sure it will at, at some point i mean you've got your solo projects you've got uh you've got dark desert eagles <clears throat> will you uh demand a uh, a ukulele solo <laughs> So uh, I'm more likely to have a ukulele solo um, in Dark Desert Eagles than I would be in Extreme. But, uh, <laughs> um, it's funny you bring up the ukulele thing we were talking about uh, before we went on camera. But I've I've uh, I've decided that you know it, it's always in February, March, and you know you know how it is here in New England. It's depressing. So it, it's dark. It winter's dragging on. So. Uh, I've had the good fortune to like, you know, with extreme, we've done the monsters of rock cruise a bunch of years in a row. We've been on the kiss cruise and, you know, I always get a taste of the tropics in, uh, February, um, you know, or I've gone on vacations or whatever. So I was unable to do that this year, you know, so I decided to have the tropics come to me. And so if I was going to be locked in my studio, I thought to myself, you know, why don't I just do something completely different? I want to learn a new instrument because so, I have a lot of time on my hands. And uh, so I picked up the ukulele for the first time, which has been so much fun to learn something new. And you can't help but smile when you play a chord on that thing. It just has this positive, cool energy to it. And so I started doing cover tunes um, in the style of the tropics. Uh, and, and I'm making a solo album called Jump the Shark that is uh, all, nice. all just ukulele songs, um, but it's all fun songs about the tropics um, or in the style of, you know, uh, little reggae or Hawaiian music. And it's just been uh, it's been fun, you know, just to, to record and do something on my own where I'm just quarantined. And I, I like I said, I, I just brought the tropics to me since I couldn't go there. I'm I'm the guy that's gonna ask. Can you grab it and play something for us or what? Uh, let's see. This will be a penalty box first. I got one. I don't know if it's a two. Well, that, that's all right. We won't. Know. Here comes the sun. That's a little monkey right there. <laughs> That's, it. That's, That's awesome. Nice. We can get a little That's Britney cool. Spears with that too, I bet. Yeah, this <laughs> one's carbon fiber too. You see this thing? That's oh, wild. wild. Is it how light is that? Oh, the thing's like a feather. But was this was say, this is uh it was a Kickstarter. Uh th this company made these, it's called Close, and uh they made these little carbon fiber guys. So um I have a couple of ukuleles that I've that I've bought uh this year, but it's been fun just recording, you know. Well, that's well, segue. You, you mentioned the tropics. Do you, does your fish back there have a name? Oh, the fish in the tank. Yeah, does, it, uh, does your fish got a name? Or is that I don't, I don't name them. I got I got a, like probably six or seven fish in there. But they oh, uh, okay. I can see the big one floating. Around. I didn't know if that was you know, you know what you what you call them. So or her. Yeah, I, I haven't named them, but they uh, that one actually picks on the rest of them. He's funny. He's pretty aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk alpacas. All right. That um, was 
Yeah, that was my question. We got to talk to alpacas. All right, okay. I got an alpaca question. Uh, so you know, you're, you, we want to hear about uh, how you came about being an alpa alpaca farmer, um, because you must be pretty handy around around the uh, around the farm to to actually. I know you got horses and and those kind of things as well. Um, but that could segue into how handy you were helping Roger Daltrey put together a grill at his house. Oh could you ex explain that after you talk about, you know, how handy you are around the, around the, uh, the um, farm? All right. Well, those are definitely another, you, you guys are good at coming up with like two or three completely different questions and all rolled into one. Um, so I, at a time when extreme had taken a long hiatus, we had kind of broken up for, you know, for a while. Um, the late nineties into, uh, you know, the early two thousands, uh, I was looking for something else to do. I had had a couple of bands that, um, you know, I, I had joined after extreme broke up and of course it's tough to make it back to the top of, uh, Everest, you know? So I, uh, I just said, you know, I just, I want to do something completely different, a new business, a new, uh, lease on life. Um, and so I got into farming alpacas and breeding them. And so, you know, alpacas are a unique livestock that, you know, they're similar. If people don't know what an alpaca is, they you know, people always call them a llama. Um, right. They're related to llamas, but they have a uh, very warm fiber. I guess you would, you would call it wool or fleece, you know? So you shear them once a year, like you would a sheep. Um, but I used to breed um, I still have a couple of alpacas up here on the hill, uh, just as pets, but I, I really get into the business of breeding them and showing them, taking them around the country. And, um, I was doing quite well at that business actually. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of really good people from all walks of life that were all obsessed with these, uh, furry lovable creatures. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it lasted for a while, but then, um, at the time, I guess in 2008, there was a downturn in the economy, and uh, it also affected the alpaca business um, negatively. And But by that time, Extreme had gotten back together, and my focus got to be towards, you know, obviously my love of music again. And so I've kind of let the alpacas, uh, uh, you know, the, the business side of it, I, I just have a few just as pets now where uh, – you know, there was a time where I had like say 30 alpacas and I was breeding them and like you said, showing them. And, uh, it was, it was a trip. So, uh, uh, the segue to Roger Daltrey is that he also had a farm, uh, that he invited us to when we met him at the Freddie Mercury concert. He said, Hey guys, come to my house for a barbecue. My, my kids are big fans of you. They'd, they'd be thrilled if you come over to the house. And we all looked at each other like, well, of course we're going to go to your house uh -huh. and hang out for the day. And uh, that was an amazing day as well. We, uh, he had cows. He had a trout pond, a uh, beautiful English tutor on hundreds of rolling acres in like Sussex, England. We, we took a train from London down there and he picked us up at the train station. And uh, next thing you know, I'm standing there with a shirtless Roger Daltrey uh, putting together a Weber grill that he had just bought. And I'm literally, uh, me and my tour manager, uh, were sitting there with wrenches with Roger, uh, putting together a grill. And, you know, sometimes I tell these stories to my friends and they think I just got to be completely full of shit like this. You know? <laughs> but, uh, a friend of mine actually had a video camera and I have footage of, of extreme, like hanging out with Roger at the, uh, at his house. So, um, yeah, there's been some some real mind blowing, um, uh, you know, experiences that that I've had personally or that Extremes had. Um, another one, you know, Gary, uh, the lead singer of Extreme, had joined Van Halen for an album, so he invited me up to Fifty One Fifty, which is Eddie's, you know, obviously his fa famous studio. Um, and so I spent a week up at at Eddie's house, hanging out with him, and. Um, uh, R.I.P. Eddie. He was a tremendous, uh, a, a great guy. Um, had his demons with with you know alcohol and and obviously was a chain smoker, um, which obviously probably led to his cancer and his his uh, um, him passing away last year. But we were, we were all devastated. Um, 
you know, he, he was a friend, you know, I hadn't spoken to him in, in years and years, but the time I was up there, he was very gracious and very kind and um, had, had probably changed rock guitar and rock music more than anyone I can think of since, you know, their debut record came out in 78. So uh, that was another surreal moment just to really be able to, you know, hang out and spend time up at, uh, at uh, 5150, you know. We've been very lucky to meet meet some of our the legends that we grew up listening to. I mean, pinch yourself is a, is a you know it's even beyond that. I mean, must be like a a, a movie. Like, how did I get here? You know, I, it really I, was I, at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I, and I look back to it, say, how did I even end up up at Eddie Van Halen's studio? If you told me that in 1984, when I was in high school listening to Van Halen and cranking it in my you know my car on the way to high school that, that I'd actually be up there, you know, hanging out with the Van Halen guys. I, I would have said, you're absolutely fucking crazy. How, how could that ever happen? <laughs> you know? I, uh, I've been listening to a book that I just finished up, uh, Tim, the one that George Henderson had recommended. It was called risk forward. And, and I was telling my nine year old daughter this morning, I was talking to her about, you know, you've got to learn to take risk in your life because at, you have to have action in your life. I mean, was some of that my plan or was it, just like, hey, here's an opportunity. Let's just go do it. What do you think if you, you look back on that, get, ended well, up yeah. at, at Helen's house, how does that happen? Oh, well, you know, obviously that was just uh, a series of um, just by chance encounters. Like, you know, Extreme had a manager who also managed Van Halen. So when Eddie and Sammy Hagar had a falling out and Extreme had just broken up, Gary had, you know, the opportunity to go audition um, and the contact to the manager, he's like, Hey, you want to go audition for Van Halen? And Gary thought at the time, you know, I'll go up there and sing, but you know, it's never going to have, they're never going to want me. I mean, I'm just like this guy from Malden, Massachusetts, you know? And before you know it, Eddie falls in love with them and his personality. And um, he's, he called me and said, you know, I think I got the gig. I think I'm going to be singing for Van Halen. And, wow. uh, yeah, so it was just like by chance, you know, kind of like, you know, who you know and prepared and met the opportunity. When when that happens, uh, and you, you guys have been uh, broken up for a while uh, when that happens, you're generally, genuinely happy for your friend uh, or going, oh, well, that's, that's the knife in the heart of extreme. I, you know, I knew that the band had was over, so it wasn't like I had this hope that, you know, and Gary wasn't responsible for, you know, Extreme's demise at the time. So I was happy for my friend. I'm like, dude, go do this, you know, go, you know, and a fringe benefit for me was access <laughs> to my favorite band in the world. Like I grew up listening to Van Halen. I can, to this day, I can say that that's my favorite, you know, hard rock band. And, um, you know, so to, get to know those guys and meet those guys and hang out at, at their concerts and to be on a first name basis. It, it still is surreal. Like that, you know, we come, come when Sammy Hagar and Michael Anthony come to town or we, you know, we've been asked to go play shows with them and we were hanging out with those guys and, and um, it, you know, we're on a first name basis. So again, it, you know, I would have never imagined when I was in high school that I'd be buddies with uh, or text, you know, with the guys that, that I grew up listening to. Right. Well, you're an accomplished musician yourself, but if you had to talk about your um, influences, would you say, I'll give you a list. John Entwistle, Getty Lee, Stanley Clark, Michael Anthony, Chris Squire. Who would you say would be your, uh, the person that motivated you the most to play bass? Oh, it's tough. You know, we, we, we have this thing as musicians and we always uh, talk about who is on our Rushmore of, you know, whether it's drummers, singers, guitar players. And I'd say of my four favorite bass players that would be up on my Rushmore would be Paul McCartney, uh, John Entwistle, um, I would say probably Getty Lee and um, John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, as far as my favorite bass players, you know. Cool. Um, I, I can't put my finger on one guy because, you know, obviously they are, they all have, uh, unique, you know, playing styles and quality. Um, but you know, again, if, if I were to put my finger on one band, probably Van Halen, um, 
as far as a hard rock band, you know, of course, uh, Led Zeppelin, the Beatles are, you know, even at a whole other level of legendary status. So, it, it, you know, you can't, you can't really, it, you know, say you have one favorite over the other, you know. What's your uh, favorite movie you've seen lately? My favorite movie, you know, it's funny. I don't really, I'm not a big movie guy. So, um, you know, I guess I've been more into, uh, you know, like Netflix series and that kind of yeah. thing. I'll take uh, that. What do you got? Well, I think one of, on my Rushmore of, <laughs> of <laughs> That's series, cool. um, Breaking Bad is going to be one of my favorites of all time. Love it. Yeah. I, ju I just finished watching all of Breaking Bad. I'd never seen it before. I just watched it in the, uh, during yeah. COVID, and I absolutely loved it. Tremendous, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah and I've start, I started watching Better Call Saul, uh, which is kind of the spinoff from it, which, yeah. is, which is pretty – I actually kind of liked it a little better, honestly. Oh, really? I haven't I haven't really I – didn't, I didn't really get into that um, as much. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, I've, I've, got one, I've got one question left for you, and I ask pretty much everybody this, but uh, what, what are you insecure about? What am I insecure about? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess like everybody else, uh, you know, when you um, when you put yourself out there and, uh, you know, even playing songs live or whatever, you always want to strive to be better. And, um, you know, I, I'll hear something back. You know how people always, uh, um, you know, if they hear their own voice back or see themselves on camera, they go, oh, my God, I can't believe that's what I sound like, you know. And uh, the same thing, if, if you're a musician and you don't feel that way, then you're never going to improve or get better. You know, you always, like, have to critically listen to yourself. And sometimes, you know, you're like, I can't even listen to that because I hear myself either out of tune or, you know, just nitpicking yourself, you know. Right. Um, but again, that's that's how you always get better is, is you, you yeah. pick up your own flaws or your faults, you know. That's interesting. I love it. Great. That's a great answer. So my last question is, I had a couple more, but I think I'm just going to go with this one. Um, you've played it, all over the world, and the count that I ended with was like 128 uh, major concerts all over the world over the decades, uh, you know, with Extreme. Um, but you played in places like the Club Casino, which has amazing history. If no one knows that Benny Goodman played there, Led Zeppelin played there, now the Dark Doors. The doors, uh, you know, Dark Desert Eagles is going to play there. Um, do you like the the smaller or the larger venues, uh, like House of Blues and those kind of things? I like the smaller. Uh, you know, Hampton Beach is always fun because it's just usually you play in the summer and it's a hot, sweaty, you know, energetic crowd. And I'm so looking forward to July 10th because, um, it, you know, it's it's a uh, it's been a long road with COVID with, uh, you know, not just for performers, but for people. I, I've, you know, there was some sort of, a, a, you know, a survey of what people missed the most about, uh, you know, while they've been on lockdown. And most, I think the number one answer was live music. So yeah. I think by July, people are going to be uh, just so psyched to hear music again and be out and, you know, hopefully you know, by then there'll be some herd immunity and people will be vaccinated. And, uh, you know, these, these shows will actually happen and not be kicked the can like another three months or six months. But, uh, I'm, I'm confident that July 10th will happen at the casino ballroom. Uh, I love venues like that. And it's, you know, don't get me wrong. It's fun to step on stage in an arena or a, uh, uh, a stadium, but the people are so far away at those shows that, um, there's no difference between 9,000 and 10,000 people or 15 or a hundred thousand people because the front row is so far away from you that you can't really see people's expression or see them laugh or smile or sing along where when people are right at your feet and more like, you know, um, uh, closer, it's a much more intimate feeling and there's a more give and take with the audience at some of the smallest shows. So that's, that's been my experience. It's, it's fun doing, uh, you know, places like Hampton Beach. People are going to be so starved for music by the summer that Wes and oops, Wes did again, may even get a gig. There's no telling. Yeah. <laughs> There's just no telling. So when Wes yeah. comes out with 
a snake wrapped around him like Britney Spears. Holy crap, things get going. I'm just saying. <laughs> we, uh, we have a few other shows that'll be fun too. We got uh, a couple of Connecticut shows coming up in May. That is, uh, it's a drive-in. It's like an outdoor thing where you get cool. the parking spot next to your car. Uh, we have a few dates coming up. They'll be on, on darkdeserteagles.com, which, oh, there you have it on the screen, uh, coincidentally. So uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll be, uh, we have a few announcements coming up. So if people check back to that website, we got a few. Uh, and if you love the Eagles, um, you know, the catalog is obviously, you know, we play all the hits. Uh, you know, we, and we kind of do the uh, 70s version of the Eagles uh, where it's, when Joe, Joe Walsh first joined the band, we, we do some of the Joe Walsh solo uh, stuff or, or, you know, like uh, Funk 49 and, and uh, um, you know, Rocky Mountain Way and that kind of stuff. But we, we pretty much do the peak of the uh, Eagles, you know, Hotel California era. Um, and it's, it's just a blast. The show's a lot of fun. Great. I'm going to, I, I have not yet been, but uh, you know, I was talking to your significant other Mel about uh, trying to get uh trying to get us out there to, to take it in. Oh, you got to come. Yeah. It's, it's uh Absolutely. it is a blast. Like I, I put on the uh, Fu Manchu Glenn Fry mustache. And, <laughs> Dude, uh, that is awesome. Oh yeah. We, we do the full tribute thing because uh, you know, people always say, well, what's the difference between a tribute band and a, a cover band, but the tribute band, you want that suspension of disbelief that you're, you know, I, I'm actually playing a role of somebody and uh, looking like someone else. And I can say shit on stage that I couldn't as myself. So I play the part of Glenn Spry, who is the lead singer of the, uh, of, of an Eagles tribute band from 1977. And nice. basically, been, awesome. yeah, we, we've been uh, not to give too much of the show away, but um, we've traveled through time and now we're, it, there's a bit of a uh, back to the future meets, um, you know, uh, spinal tap kind of uh, thing that goes on stage. And we do some, you know, we've taken some cues from like the Eagles documentary where there's infighting amongst the band members. There's, you know, jokes about drugs, alcohol, sex, all, you know, all the stuff that the typical rock band shit, it all uh, happens on stage and it makes, you know, it makes it a, a fun evening where it's not just about getting up there and playing the music you know if you if you want to hear like an elvis impersonator you're going to want to see him in the the white you know uh, rhinestone suit right you're not just going to want to right. see some guy get up there so it's it's a bit of the image uh also thrown in with you know playing the music right and it makes for a fun show so very cool can't wait to see it uh, uh, eric you're gonna have to you were coming to boston anyways to take in a game so let's uh yeah, let's just make it july 10th Oh yeah, totally, totally for sure. <laughs> Maybe we can get a backstage pass, you know. Right. Yeah, we we could hook that up for sure. I'm I'm in. I mean, Wes is in too. You know, Jesse Cole when he was on invited uh, Wes to be one of the uh, man nanas for a game, which is the banana guys. And so you know, I could see Wes, you know, like I could see Wes out on stage like with the tambourine, you know, just going freaking crazy. So it's relentless, by the way, Pat. It just never ends. <laughs> Poor Wes. <laughs> Poor Wes. Pat, thank you. I, Pat, I guess I had one last question. Do you ever, you know, back when Honey Badger, when all that was going on, were you like, Honey Badger don't give a fuck? I mean, were you, were you saying that, you know, just personally? Still to this day, we, we like, you nice. know, people like love that Honey Badger thing. And, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I get a good laugh out of that whole thing. It's pretty funny. Hey, I want to know, I want to know if the Badger Cam is going to make an appearance at any of your shows soon. So I kind of retired that thing, but I, I used to wear like a GoPro on a helmet and uh, um, wear it out on stage and kind of, you know, it gave people an interesting perspective of what it's like to be in the band and what we see or what you know, looks from our perspective. So um, I did it for a tour or two, um, but then I kind of retired that whole uh, that whole gag, but it, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it makes you look like, you know, you, you're about to get on a bike, you know? <laughs> yeah. Drive, yeah. So. Yeah. Always good. Well, so. hey, thank, thank you so much for joining us. It, it's, I mean, we could go on for hours about all the things that you've uh, got going on, uh, but we really want to thank you for taking some time to join us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, let me know if it's on July 10th, we'll, we'll like, actually meet in person instead of, uh, you know, on a Zoom call or whatever this, yeah, this is. Well, 
I think there's only one thing left to do. We get out of here, and 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 I don't know if you know, but but you know, the frozen hand. You have to do that. That's it. <laughs>